Code patterns have been requested a lot lately. And as it seems, that is my actual research topic. What a coincidence! We even have an amazing special guest today, Nathan from GDQuest. So join our adventure to find the five greatest code patterns Godot has ever seen. Our first pattern comes in handy when you need to receive asynchronous calls. Usually you can solve this with a signal. You connect a function to a signal and when it is emitted at some point in the future, your function is called. However, sometimes it is not clear if the signal is relevant to you. Say you have a service object that you can post requests to. It has a queue of requests and at some point it will handle your request. You wouldn't want to be called after each request that was handled prior. So it would be better to make the service call you back when your request is finished. You may not notice, but you can pass functions as arguments. In Godot 4, those are callables and they are so-called first-class citizens, which means they have special rights. In this case, the special right to be passed as an argument, returned from a function and assigned to a variable, which is really, really convenient. In Godot 3, you can use a functref to wrap functions. Functref is a class and objects are first-class citizens. Or you simply pass the function's name as a string and its arguments and use call or call v. When using call, you pass the arguments after another. Call v expects an array of arguments, which it unpacks. To keep things organized, you can encapsulate this information into a command object. With this pattern, you can do some really neat stuff. One of my recent favorites is a call delayed function. We found ourselves adding timers all the time to make small delays and it looked like this. But you can encapsulate that away into a util call and just pass the function that should be called, the arguments and the delay. Hey, I'm Nathan from the channel GDQuest and the next pattern we're gonna look at is called the global signal bus. You want the player's score to increase in the game when doing some actions such as killing enemies. Or when a user changes an option such as the text size, you want it to update in the entire app. In other words, something happens in one scene in your game such as the enemy dying and you want to reflect that with a change in a completely separated unrelated scene. Typically, you would connect every monster that spawns in the game to the on-screen UI or to a third node in a scene that contains both, such as your level manager uh, node, and update the score every time an enemy dies. With this pattern, you can simplify things. It consists of creating one file that extends node and that defines signals. I'm going to hide the other two here. We have a signal called mob died uh, that emits a score value. It's the amount the score should increase when killing a monster. Then we go to project, project settings, auto load and register this script as an auto load. This allows us to access it from any script in our project. Then, if we go to the mob script, we can emit the mob died signal directly from our event singleton and we pass the points that the monster is worth. The last part is to go to our UI where we can directly connect to the event's autoload signal in the ready function. We don't have to pass the node around because it's an autoload. We connect the mob died signal to some function on events mob died here and we add the mob's value to the current score. This pattern is pretty easy and it will help you simplify your code, so I recommend that you try it out. There's been a bit of a debate over the years whether object pooling is mandatory or not even needed at all. There's this old tweet by Juan floating around and we feel like this needs some context. Every object needs memory for its variables and behind the scenes it is not straightforward how to get that, especially when you build new objects with the new keyword or even instantiate scenes that are composed of many objects. This is called dynamically allocated, and it is impossible to foresee how much memory is needed and for what. Behind the scenes, a bit of memory needs to be found that is large enough and currently free when you allocate a new object. And it needs to be given back when the object is deleted, or else you will just run out of memory very fast. There are different strategies how to do that. In languages like C++, you have to manage parts of that yourself, making your life pretty hard and memory leaks quite common. Doing memory management automatically is slower but less work for the programmer. In Java and many game engines a garbage collection is used. When an object is deleted it is just flagged as gone and every now and then all deleted objects are collected and the garbage is brought out. This is quite fast on average but the work is concentrated all at once 
and might lag your game out a bit. Godot does reference counting, where the engine counts how many references are held to an object. If no one remembers you, you are truly dead. No one can interact with you, so you might as well be freed. This leads to more predictable workloads, and for many games this means you are fine without object pooling, hence the tweet. Still there are games like bullet hells or action games with many spells and so on. For these games, instantiating and deleting stuff over and over again adds up quickly. The key idea of object pooling is to be less wasteful. Not throw away objects after just using them once, and instead clean them and reuse them. For our games we use a quite convenient approach. Instead of instantiating an object, we ask an object pool. The object pool keeps track of all its instant objects in a dictionary. You can either use resource file paths or packed scenes. The latter is useful if you want to preload the scenes. If the object pool has the object we want, it just returns one. If not, it instantiates it. From the outside, we cannot see the difference. In both cases, they call their ready function when added to the scene tree, because we tell it to by calling request ready. For stuff that really just needs to be done once, we can call this prepare function. Fetching nodes of the scene tree can be done here, so you save yourself fetching them again and again. And later, instead of deleting them, we give it back to the pool. You could add other features, like limiting the pool, etc. But we found this approach works fine for most cases. The one thing you need to make sure is that the object is reset properly. For this, keep in mind that everything done in ready and the on ready vars is updated. But other state needs to be reset manually, so be careful when deleting stuff or changing nodes. When using animation players, we often manually play the reset animation. And do not forget to return your object at the end. Once you have this in place, getting objects from the pool is incredibly cheap. In Godot, nodes work in such a way by default that you can remove some and the scene should keep working, uh, albeit a bit differently because you just removed something. And this is a form of composition called aggregation, where you have objects that sit side by side and that work in a more or less standalone way. Um, most nodes work this way out of the box, but sometimes you want some nodes to work as components. For example, in this demo, I would really want to show some of these areas, as you can see here, uh, make them a bit more visible for teaching purposes so that uh, students can see this collision shape at runtime and they only see that they don't see all the collisions of every mesh in the level and to do that i've used a property of nodes to create a new node that works as a component so uh, you can see it in my scene doc here the debug draw collision shape if it has a collision shape as a parent it's going to display this hello here that will tell you um, when you interact with something when you can do an interaction to achieve that uh, we use a function of nodes called get parent i'm going to uh, spare you the the details of the code but we call the get parent function uh, to get the parent node and then we run some checks on that so we first ensure that this parent is a collision shape because we only want to display this shape if it's a collision shape then we check the kind um, and if it's one of the supported kinds we display a mesh with a given shader so this is a way to make nodes work as components you get the parent you check what the parent is you can use asserts for that and then you run some code uh, in consequence you can also use nodes to take control of the root node of a scene, the topmost node, or all other nodes in that scene. You can use that for patterns like the state machine, which you will see in our other video in this collab. If I open the run script here, I have lines where it says if owner dot is on floor or owner dot is on wall. The owner property is available on every node and by default it points at the root of the scene. Here it's the player node. So you can use that to create behaviors that take control of the root node of a scene. There are many types of games that have a lot of data, like upgrades in a roguelike or items in an RPG. And it is so tempting to represent them all as code. 
but it is bad. It is just so hard to manage the change and there are better ways. My two favorites are resources and tables. Resources are great because you can stay completely within the engine to add and edit them, etc. Just make a script, declare it as a resource, give it a class name and throw in some export files. And there it is. It can have sub resources, text, basically anything. Tables are cool because they are by far the most readable solution. You always have an overview over all your data, but you need to export them as CSV files and parse them with the CSV parser. Very powerful, but a bit more setup. There's also JSON, which is great as a tool for communication and really bad to hold your data. <laughs> it is technically human readable, but not much better than code after all. In any case, the goal is to add a new resource or a new line in your CSV file and have as little work as possible. For this, an object needs to examine itself, which we will call reflection. And the idea is a slight bit terrifying. We have this spell class, for example, and a spell table. A nice thing we can do is to take the header of the column and use it as an argument of the set function to set a variable with the same name. We can simply put up a new column, a new variable, and we are done. We can even use the type of the variable to cast the field in the right way, using type of. If the spell has associated code with it, you can use the name and see if there is a GD file with the same name and load it dynamically. Be aware that it is called .gdc after it is exported. So drop in this weird construct. You can now add a spell, give it stats and maybe add code if you feel like it. And it is just in the game. Nothing else to do. So you might have already heard of GDQuest. They make great tutorials. On their channel you can find another video we made together with five more code patterns. So go and watch that now.